Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and our final few shows about uh, Tunisia in our Torch to Tunis series. So my guest today is Trevor Sheehan, African Stalingrad on Twitter and with a website of the same name, who will share photos and video from his many trips to Tunisia. Trevor is a former British Army officer and professional photographer. And yes, I'm just watching the comments there. There is some bloke wearing a hat sitting in a chair, I think, Mark Luke. That will be me. Uh, if you're new to the channel, there's been a few new people over the weekend. Thanks for coming on board. Don't forget to click subscribe. Don't forget to click the little bell so you receive notifications. And all the information you need, as always, is in the description below. And for following some advice I got last week, I've started to put the actual playlist at the top of the description. So I'm going through all of our old back catalogue so that if in this series you want to see the rest of the shows in the torch to tunis series the first little bit of the description will have the other shows in the playlist so hopefully you'll find it easy to find what you're looking for so but without further ado i'll bring trevor in so good afternoon or evening trevor how are you today i'm very well thanks paul hello everybody so it would be fair to say that this is going to be a very video and photographic rich presentation and because some of the guests we've had for lots of reasons haven't necessarily been to the places they have talked about they've studied it from after action reports and and photos and archives but you you have been there so first part of the question is when did you first go to tunisia and second part is what is it that keeps drawing you to go back there yeah great questions actually uh, paul uh, i mean i first went there in i think it was about 1975 so um that's only 30 years after the end of the second world war i might add uh and i was on a um a geography field trip at uh, university looking at roman ruins and uh, this little boy came up to me uh, with little sort of Roman artifacts that he had nicked off the site. Uh, they might have been fake. They might have been real. Who knows? I said I wasn't interested. And then he took out of his pocket a whole bunch of uh, bullets uh, that he had obviously picked up on the battlefield, some of them unfired. And um, it re then reminded me, oh, yeah, of course, the Second World War happened in Tunisia. And um, so uh, I, I followed it from there. Um, and what keeps drawing me back? Well, um, the weather, for one, mm -hmm. <laughs> it can be rather lovely. Don't go in the winter. Uh, don't go there in November, December or January, like the First Army did, uh, because you'll, you'll get peed on and there'll be snow and it will just be miserable. Um, but outside of that, it's absolutely lovely. And I think that will come up in the discussion is that the, the, the range of climate and the range of tonight the terrain in Tunisia is probably surprising to some people. It isn't like El Alamein. It isn't just flat desert. That that it, it yep. is a it, it, its own type of terrain. It's own right. But folks, um, Trevor has come armed with a PowerPoint. We've also got plenty of um, video footage as well for you. So bear in mind, I'm doing lots of things. I'm juggling the video screens and the PowerPoint. And well, Trevor's actually controlling the PowerPoint and your questions. So folks. With uh, this set uh, uh, show, what we'll do is we'll do questions pertinent to the battle or the slide that's on screen as we go along. But the kind of broader questions, perhaps about tourism, Tunisia, or, or the campaign in general, we'll probably save them to the end. But basically, I'm going to hand over to Trevor now and uh, and sit back. And uh, I've been looking forward to this one. It's going to be really good. So uh, over to you, Trevor. Right. Thanks very much, uh, Paul. Well, can I first of all say that um, if anybody wants to contact me after the show, there's my email address at the bottom. There's my Twitter handle above it. Uh, more than happy to uh, engage. Not a problem at all. Uh, so let me just get going, make sure this is all working. Yeah, there we go. So um, I, I think what I'm all about, I'm well, let's put it this way. I'm, I, I don't have a book to sell. I'm not an author. I'm not a tour guide. Uh, I'm not a historian. Um, I'm a consumer of history. I buy the books. I watch the films, I listen to the podcasts, and I go there. And what I find particularly useful is that I want to turn the sort of black and white image in my mind of, of the Second World War into colour. Um, so I've just I've got a couple of samples there on the slide. Uh, the City Nasir railway station, I think that's the Falschmeiger um, in the foreground. They had a skirmish um, with the British. Uh, very early on in the in the campaign, um, it's no longer a railway station, uh, and the the people who run it, it's a little grain store. Uh, very happy to, to 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 see visitors. And at the bottom, you'll see on the right hand side, that's uh, General Patton at El Guitar, and on the left is me at El Guitar about a month ago, on exactly the same spot. And uh, it, it's um, it, I don't know, it just brings it to life, frankly. 
Um, and, and broadly speaking, just to, I, I'm interrupting you really early. I mean, we can ta- ta- tackle this later on. Is is how easy is it finding locations? Is it is it is it kind of mm-hmm. a fairly straightforward process, or do they involve lots and lots of head scratching and asking locals? It means going to archives. Right. It means going to local museums and 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 so on. And it well, I mean, I, I've been at it for years and years and years. Um, uh, it, I, I now sort of take it for granted. In this particular case, oddly enough, about General Patton, uh, it's a very famous photograph. Mm. Um, and it was the guy from Life magazine who actually took the photos. Um, and that's been seen all over the world. And that tends to be on sort of the front cover of the, any books about Patton and so on. Um, it, it took me a long, long while to find it because I walked around the ground with, uh, with my um, travel companion, Chris, to find the exact spot. And we couldn't find it. And in the end, we uh, found a chap in the village who did know where at the exact spot. And it turns out he is also um, runs the village museum, which has got a lot of Second World War artifacts in the museum. And and he showed us the, the, the exact spot. So we're absolutely delighted with that. And we gave him a tip, as, as you do. Um, uh, Paul, could you run um, the first video, please? Video number one. Yep, will do. Sheehan from AfricanStalingrad.com. The Battle of Fond Duc was the first joint British, American and French core level attack in Tunisia. The aim was to burst through the Fond Duc Gap, then take the city of Karawan and trap the Axis retreating forces who were going up the coast road. When the Allies finally got through to Karawan City, there was great joy, particularly amongst the Jews who were allowed to remove their yellow stars, and the French population took control of the German headquarters in the city. That building is still there, but in a very poor state. The Allies also found some German stragglers and marched them off to prisoner of war camps. The Battle of Fondue Gap itself was actually a failure. Instead of taking one day, it took three days, for two main reasons. One was the US forces totally failed to achieve their objectives. The British took too long to capture one key feature, the Jebel Rawhab. Nevertheless, they did all finally get through, but the Germans had largely escaped up the coast road to Tunis. Well, brilliant okay, stuff. So, so, so that's what I mean by connecting with history. So uh, I find it fascinating to go to the um, German headquarters in 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 uh, uh, Karawan, um, and when you look at the old black and white movies, and the, and the stuff is still there. And in, in that respect, I don't know how the, how Tunisia compares with Normandy, but there's a lot of debris and buildings and infrastructure. And frankly, in a lot of places. If Patton, Rommel, or Montgomery, or Bradley, uh, or Eisenhower went back there, nothing's changed, mm. uh, and it's a uh, it's a very vivid um, uh, piece of history, as it were. So uh, let me uh, crack on with um, the the main part of the presentation, and and I want to start. If you look on the left hand side, November 1942, and uh, two things: a Stuka and an M3 American tank. Uh, very unusually, shouldn't really happen, should never happen. There was a battle between M3 tanks which broke into an airfield just on the edge of Tunis City, a Jadida airfield. And the tanks were shooting Stukas as they were taking off. Uh, the tank uh, force were completely on their own. There was no infantry, no air cover, no uh, artillery, mortars, um, completely on their own. And they destroyed quite a few aircraft and then they had to withdraw because they were being attacked. Uh, so you, you look at that, which is almost like a, a almost a, a comedic sort of event with what happened on the right um, in May 1943, just a few months later, with 270,000 prisoners. And I think you use that particular photo in your build up uh, uh, video, Paul. Um, that actually is in Matur. And um, that ground is still just as you see it there. Um, uh, Ike and Eisenhower uh, put it into words. 
So this is what Eisenhower said in December. The best way to describe our operations to date is that they have violated every recognized principle of war. So he was displeased. And yet six months later, we are masters of the North African shores. What a transformation. Wow. What a transformation. Absolutely extraordinary. And, and a, a lot of my presentation is going to be about how they did that. Because that is that is a massive transformation, whichever way you look at it. Um, you may not know much about Tunisia, the country. It's in the Mediterranean, uh, North Africa. It's about the size of England. It, it had a population of about two and a half million. Where the where the, the war was, all the battles, that's in about two thirds of uh, Tunisia. And that's an area about the size of Ireland. Uh, also something of the population, as I mentioned, two and a half million, the 60,000 Jews, uh, 100,000 Italians, mainly very poor peasant Italians who uh, escaped in little boats from Italy to North Africa. I've heard of that one before. Uh -huh. um, and about 10,000 Maltese. Many of the Maltese were pro-German, as it happens. We can perhaps come on to that uh, a little bit later. Um, and also, in terms of the geography, uh, it, it is a very complex country. It's a sort of north to south type place, not much left to right or east to west. Uh, you've got in the middle there, you've got two what, what are called dorsals. They are long ridges of mountains. And there's two. There's the western dorsal and the eastern dorsal. And they meet sort of in the, in, uh, up at the top. Um, in the north, uh, it's very, parts of it are really rich. There's wheat uh, grows very, very well in, in, in various areas, but it can be very rocky. It's, I suppose it's a combination in the north of, uh, um, if, if you're English, you'll perhaps understand this, a combination of a bit like the Lake District and a bit like the Yorkshire Dales and a bit like Dartmoor, all mixed in in that, in that northern area. And that's where the two big cities are, Tunis and Berserk. Uh, in the middle, you've got those, those two dorsals. Um, and they're a bit like sort of big Hadrian Wall type uh, frontier type things but they do have a lot of gaps inside them um, and I don't mean when, when I don't mean a pass I mean an actual gap where the mountains stop uh, and they are obviously pretty vital to, to get through and then down in the south um, that's where the true desert is so below that middle bit uh, there's a blue thing that is a, called a chot um, and that's relevant to to uh, the campaign in that you'll see where the the chot which is basically a sometimes wet, sometimes dry salt pan, very, very large, goes right across the width of the country there. And on the right-hand side, the eastern side, uh, you'll see Wadi Akarit, uh, Mareth, Mednin. Um, there are some mountains there as well. So they create really tight choke points. And if wow. you've got a, and you can't go over the chot, you've got to go through those, those coastal gaps. And that's really relevant. And on the coast itself, it's coastal Sahel. So it's uh, lovely beaches, uh, very flat, uh, delightful countryside. And that's where all the tourists go. So the Allied first objectives were th their, their, their key aim, their, their directive they received from the combined chiefs of staff were to capture three ports, Bizert, Tunis, and Tripoli. Bizert and Tunis first. That's Tunis port. That, I took that photograph um, as I was taking off in a British Airways flight out of Tunis. <laughs> it's a large, it's a large port, uh, lots of um, infrastructure. It can take the biggest possible ships. The airport is uh, the all-weather airport from 1943, still there, uh, and that's very close by. And it's outside the city. A really significant port. But there were also some minor ports, Sousse, Sfax, and Gabs, also pronounced as Gabis. And a key thing, airfields. And that was one of the objectives. And a lot of these airfields still exist, the ones they, they built, particularly the, the flat uh, ground around the, the city of uh, Kairouan. And you'll see on the right-hand side, uh, on my recent trip to Tunisia, I mapped out all the Second World War airfields in southern Tunisia, and there's over 50, um, some of them still being used. You'll see that one there on the left, that's Solomon airfield that's used by a uh, crop duster aircraft. Still there. 
So um, I, 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 some people are going to get a bit upset with me now because I'm going to simplify the timeline, but just to make it for, for, for clarity, really. And I'm going to be putting arrows on there uh, about movements and so on, which are, which are correct, but they're not necessarily following the right contours and so on. And um, I, I, I would just say that when General Montgomery wrote his memoirs and it covered Tunisia, this is the method he chose. And if it's good enough for Monty, it's good enough for me. Well, there you uh, are. Yeah, fine. <laughs> but there you are. So um, without further ado, uh, let's see how they got on. Uh, well, Anderson's first army were coming from Algeria. He had some Americans with him. Uh, Von Arnhem uh, went into Bezert and Tunis straight away. So it, it was a race. Who could get to Tunis or Bezert or both the quickest and who could take it? And, and, and it's called Anderson's first army. It wasn't an army at all. I mean, it was a division plus, if you're lucky. And he used two routes up on the north coast past uh, Tabarka uh, to where there are, you can see two blue marks there. That's two more giant lakes stroke shots. And the other one was through the town of Mejazel Bab. And when you get to Mejaz el -Bab, it's a lovely town, market town, in a valley, uh, lots of Roman ruins and one little bridge over the one and only river which flows all year round, the Majurda River. Uh, he then split a um, slightly northern route that went via Taborba, passed a little hill on the left called Longstop Hill, um, and then the more direct route. Uh, and he did, there was some parachute um, activity as well at that time. Um, which was very uh, unsuccessful. Now, right in the middle of that slide, dead important, um, is the French. The biggest army in Tunisia at the beginning of the war in Tunisia was the French army. And they didn't know which way to turn. And the Tunisian uh, bit of the uh, French army was about 10,000 strong at, uh, at, at the beginning, very poorly equipped, under the Vichy um, control, and the general in charge, General Barre, um, didn't know which way to turn. Mm. He contacted um, Algiers and asked for direction. Should he be resisting the Germans or resisting the British? He literally did not know which way to turn. Um, he eventually got a message from Algiers saying, yes, you're going to be on the same side as, as the, uh, you know, re resist the Germans. But that took two or three days. Uh, but he also had troops guarding the port and the airfield that von Arnhem's troops were coming in on. And he had the guns pointing at the Germans, but didn't open fire. Um, eventually, um, after a few days, they moved the, the whole army moved to uh, Mejaz el Bab, and they took um, uh, up arms alongside the British. Um, but it must have been very difficult for him, actually, because at the end of the day, he was refusing an order from a legitimate government. Mm. which he was meant to be serving. So that that's tough. And one of the first problems he had were soldiers saying, well, if we're going to be fighting alongside the British uh, against the Germans uh, and against Vichy, who's paying our wages? I mean, Good really point. A simple mm. matter as that. Um, one of the first places they came across in the north was a place called Green and Bald Hills. And this is... Um, uh, it, and again, it's because of the mountain ranges there. A lot of the roads um, don't have much to the left and the right of them. Frankly, they're just going through uh, uh, valleys. And the northern route, the one and only road in the northern route, heading towards uh, Bezert, goes through this very tight spot, uh, which were nicknamed Green and Bald Hills. And when you go there, um, you can see there's still a, 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 a memorial there to the Argyle of Sutherland Highlanders. Uh, and there's a, a railway in, in the, um, uh, an abandoned railway now, but it's still covered in, uh, in bullet holes. Um, and I think I'm right in saying, yes, um, Paul, if you could run video number two, please. I will do it. Just, just before I do, just to, just to recap a couple of things you said, I, I'm already kind of reminding myself that that political element of not knowing about the French, which Michael Nyberg will pick up again later in the week and will come up and has already come up, is the element that's kind of unique to Torch and beyond Torch in that at the very conceptual stage of it, they don't quite know 
what well not quite know they definitely don't know what the french in uh, in theater are going to do so that that adds an interesting dynamic to the torch thing and also you know you're talking about the building of airfields getting to ports it seems to me that compared to the earlier north african campaign going back to the you know libya and egypt and the, the Allies weren't sort of as much planning there. You know, the, the battle was going back and forth along the coast there. But by 42, the Allies have got kind of enough vision, perhaps, to be starting to try and take the war that they want to play it their way, dictating terms, so to speak, in in how they want to set about taking the war the, to the enemy. Whereas in North well, America... Well, they, they, they did do some conceptual planning and scenario yeah. planning before they did this. And one of the plans was... Let's not go along the coast. Yeah. Let's land instead of landing Morocco or Algeria. Let's land at least one force direct into Bezert port or Tunis port. Yeah. Um, with with support from the air force in Malta, which is very yeah. close by. It's only sixty now, miles away. It, it's just. It's. I think you know. I'm. I'm, I'm going to kind of go down a, a rabbit hole. I don't want to go, but it's. It, it's. It is it's it's in between the North African campaigns and the kind of later campaigns in Italy and, and and Normandy for a reason. It's 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 harking back to the what's happened before, but it's also predictive of what's going to happen later on. It's a real transitional phase, I think, for the for the yeah. Allies in how they are, and you're going to be elaborating on this as we go on, how they are waging war and on whose terms they want to wage war. Um, you know, the early part of the war. It's basically the Allies responding to everything the Axis are doing, and then the, la the latter part of the war, it's the Axis mm. responding to what the Allies are doing. But the middle part, it's 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 that changing over period. I think is so fascinating. But anyway, yeah. I'll, I'll play your video. Well, well, in in the one of the planners uh, when they were working up the best method to take a Bezert and Tunis, one of the planners said, if you go direct and do a landing in Bezert or Tunis, you could end up with another Narvik, mm. which is a a amphibious expeditionary force out on a limb big time yeah and they could have just been destroyed and so that was the uh, that was a, a bit of a tipping point but if you could just run the uh yeah, run we'll video go, number two, please um so there's no uh there's, there's no commentary with this one so this i took this video um a few, uh, last year actually um this is on top of what's known as bald hill because there's not much growing on it the hill directly opposite is Green Hill, and down in the valley is the road going from left to right. That very far hill on the horizon, that little bump you just saw there, that's the hill where the prisoners of war were held. So that's how close they were to Matur, and then just beyond that is Bezert. So, and Green and Bald Hills, they had several attempts over the, the coming weeks to try and take it, and they couldn't. And in fact, the Germans held, and, and Italians, held Green and Bald Hills uh, right through until the end of the campaign. Wow. Uh, the Americans tried to take it as well. And, and in the end, it was never taken. They, the Germans just uh, withdrew at the, at the far end. Brilliant um, stuff. I'll put the PowerPoint back up. That was great. OK, so um, now in um, December, um, it, it rained and it rained and it rained and it rained. And if you... Um, haven't been to Tunisia uh, and you go in December or January, uh, try and experience what it's like to walk in the mud because it, it has an extraordinary quality. Um, and one of the key hills that they knew they had to take was Longstop because it completely overlooked the Majorda Valley and the two roads that led to Tunis from there. Uh, one road went via the um, small village of uh, Tiborba, um, and one went uh, the other direction, direct to uh, Tunis. But it was absolutely awful. Um, uh, one of the sort of important side, sort of, it's, it's not exactly a, a rabbit hole, uh, Paul, but a uh, side point I, I, I want to make, that at the beginning of December with uh, Von Arnim, you would think Von Arnim was a really busy guy trying to build up his forces and so on. But he took time in the first week of December to write an edict um, about the Jews in Tunisia. 60,000 Jews live in Tunisia. And he wrote this long sort of passage about how we need to take their money, that they don't work, that they exploit everybody, all the usual tropes that you associate yeah. with it. And he was, he was a real anti-Semite, big time. And, and remember, he had just come from Russia. He was a Russian corps commander. Um, 
and you know he got the call go you're going to be the um uh, theater commander in tunisia he was there two and a half days later so you would think he wouldn't have time for this sort of thing but there we are he did um and um i'll come on to the jews a bit later as well. I'm worth mentioning that because at some point, Trevor, I'm go- I've, I've got a guest lined up to talk about the Holocaust in North Africa, which aren't you know, that that is not an area we think of, and some of it, of course, mm-hmm. is more what how bad it could have gone. There, there was there was obviously removal and extermination of some some Jews from from the North African area, but it could have been a lot worse. And 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 the book that the, the guest I'm going to have on is kind of talking about what actually happened and and give us some kind of idea about how bad yeah. things could have got if it had gone a yeah, different yeah. way. It, we we don't generally, as viewers, we don't think of the Holocaust affecting this area. But you know, the fact is that a lot of the German officers are there. Are, have you said there? Are, are, have signed up the same ideology, and they're going with it there with the same basic principles. It is that we mm-hmm. have sort of separated that theater from that aspect of the war. I think you're absolutely right. Um, what they got them to do? They got them to do forced labor. So they were the anti tank ditches um, around Taborba. Uh, the wiring, all all that, all that labour uh, was done by the Jews of Tunisia. Um, so there we are. Uh, right. So if we now go into um, January, so I'm I'm going to I'm going to race ahead because I, I recognise we've been I've, I've been going perhaps a bit a bit slow. Um, no, it's fine. We love it. Really, the 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 Axis were taking the initiative. Um, Eisenhower had to write a letter to the Joint Chiefs explaining why he hadn't captured Tunis and why he was pausing the campaign because of the mud and because of the difficulty of getting logistics um, over the over the beaches, on the railways. A classic example, railways. Algeria has a, um, a railway gauge which is different to the one in Tunisia. So if you're going to be transporting stuff by train, uh, from Algeria to Tunisia, when it gets to the border, you've got to change the trains. So th- there were logistic, absolute uh, logistic nightmares. And um, I'm hoping Richard O'Sullivan is uh, is is watching tonight because yeah. um, he, he'll be he'll be uh, he'll want to make sure the London Irish and, and the, all the other Irish units are mentioned here, because the Germans put an enormous amount of pressure on the British brigades south of uh, Medjaz Bab during January, when the weather was at its worst, absolutely pulverised them. And one, one particular regiment, the London Irish Regiment, after about a week of absolute, you know, hundreds, hundreds dying, getting injured, being buggered about, they had to dig in about five or six times in a week uh, and, and carry all their kit sort of 10 miles in between each dig, they were absolutely exhausted. And at the end of that week, that regiment basically collapsed and a lot of soldiers ran away, deserted, not to the Germans, but just ran away. Mm. And there was talk at that time that the London Irish and maybe others as well, I'm not just picking on the London Irish, um, that the pressure was just too much to bear, frankly. So, mm. uh, but the, the Germans were definitely on the ascendancy, particularly with aircraft. They had all weather airfields. The Brits and Americans had airfields covered in mud and so that was uh that that was not good uh, but they did have the initiative without a doubt and then the, the, and eisenhower had to do some groveling without a doubt some good news spitfire mark nines and churchill's tanks started to arrive in uh, in january and uh that that was good i I'm, I'm not an aircraft expert by any means but as i understand it the spitfire mark nine was more than a match for the fuck of wolf 109 which was causing havoc in Tunisia at that time. And the Churchill tank is, um, well, it's everybody's favourite, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> it's my favourite, uh, yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, the Axis were having a real manpower crisis. Getting bodies over into Tunisia from Sicily and from mainland Italy was uh, was difficult, so they started recruiting locally. And it is quite amazing. I mean, I've just got that little clip, uh, that photograph I took there from the German uh, cemetery outside Tunis, and you expect people like Carl Schultz and Eric, or whatever his name is, and, and Stocking Geiger. And then suddenly you get Ben Haji Mohammed Abdurrahman on the German war memorial. So a lot of Tunisians joined the German army. Uh, they weren't, so they were clearly motivated to do it. And they weren't motivated because of uh, um, money, because there was nothing to buy in the shops, uh, far more motivated because they felt that the Germans, I hope, 
could help liberate Tunisia from the French colonial from French colonial rule. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about that later. Um, slight change of tack. We've got to remember, whilst the war at this time was going on in the north, Montgomery and Rommel were in Libya, having a, a one chasing the other. Rommel was heading back towards um, Tunisia. Meanwhile, Montgomery was sending long-range reconnaissance and raiding uh, uh, parties uh, into Libya, uh, so uh, along the Libyan coast, but also into Tunisia. Uh, and just want to point out two things here. There's the Akarit line and the Mareth line. We'll come on to them later. But they're dead important, and they needed to be checked out because they were choke points. And the Mareth line was particularly well um, constructed was lots of concrete bunkers and so on. And uh, those, th th those choke points had to be checked out, particularly by the long-range desert group, to find a way around them, which is what they did. The SAS did some uh, reconnaissance as well, but they also particularly went there for, for uh, raiding. Now, the, the picture on the left with the, with the... Is it a donkey or a mule? I can't ever remember. What yep, the difference one of them, is. yep. <laughs> <laughs> one of them. Um, I, when, when I was there last month... Um, just driving through the desert, came across this whole load of debris, and it was a whole bunch of flimsies, the old uh, British petrol mm. can, loads of them, um, all, all used up. And I'm assuming, because it was on a long-range desert group SAS route that they took, that it was one of their fuel dumps. Um, and anyway, all this stuff was, uh, was really there. And there was this completely random don donkey or mule um, all, all on its own. So I have no idea what it, what it was doing there. No farmers around or anything like that. But it seems pretty happy, actually. But there we are. Yep. Could, Look, you looks, run looks the... <laughs> Could you run the next um, video, please? Number three. Right, we'll do. So this one, um, you'll, you'll, it's um, coming up now. Here we go. I'm Trevor Sheehan from AfricanStalingrad.com. This is the area where David Sterling, founder of Britain's Special Air Service, the SAS, was captured in 1943. As David Mortimer, in his excellent book, The Phony Major, says, as they approached the Jebel Tobaga, the terrain became hillier, with wadis running from the fields into the rising ground. Stirling ordered the column into one of the wadis, and they drove along the dry riverbed for a few hundred metres before he called a halt. Get your heads down, he told his men, and they would continue at dusk. No sentries were posted. Such an oversight was incomprehensible unless, perhaps, Stirling was caught in capture. Physically, he was a wreck, but he may also have been suffering from an incipient nervous breakdown from the pressure of command. Now, this area and behind me is Jebel uh, Tobega Fatnasa, and slightly beyond that is the area where Montgomery did the Battle of Wadi Akarit. Off to my right hand side is going to be the main railway line uh, going along the coast, which may well have been a target of David Sterling. Nevertheless, he and most of his men were captured here in 1943. Well, that was just brilliant. And I know you're going to say it yourself, but how unique was that, folks? I mean, as far as you know, Trevor, you're pretty much the first person to, to go there. Um, and just, yeah, nothing to see in the sense that it's just another bit of sandy rock. But what a cool place to have been to, especially... Uh, following rogue heroes that came out at the end of last year, um, amazing. Yeah, that you found I, mean, it. I mean, other than the lo other than the local farmer, I, I I can't prove it, but I suspect I was the first person back there since 1943 that knew it was David Sterling, uh, and David Mortimer was a great help in finding that uh, uh, location for me. So I'm just, uh, thank you for that. Um, so let me uh, just press on a wee bit, um, yep. and I'm sort of introduce Rommel, who was withdrawing from Libya, and Montgomery's Eighth Army which was advancing from Libya. And uh, there was, in terms of the big picture across the whole campaign now, um, there was decisions needed to be made by Rommel and von Arlen and their boss, Kesselring, in Italy, about what to do. Uh, there was a danger that if you just see the north there where the Americans are, uh, they could have moved across to the coast and blocked Rommel's withdrawal. And there was a real risk of that. 
but the Americans were very dispersed in that area. Um, and just above them on the, on the dorsals were the French, who were extremely weak, very poorly equipped. And above that, Anderson's First Army. They had absolutely no reserves. They were just flat out keeping their head above water, um, <laughs> sometimes literally, um, against the uh, against von Arnhem's uh, Germans. So what 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 could Rommel do to preempt being cut off in southern Tunisia? Well, his his idea was very bold, and that was to go through the Americans and completely encircle the British and French and go right up to the Mediterranean coast. In fact, there were a number of plans being mooted at the time. Von Arnhem had a completely different plan. Um, and, and in fact, what I would say is at this time, as far as the Axis is concerned, in, in my judgment, is there was a policy vacuum. And Rommel and Von Arnhem were effectively making it up as they went along. They hated each other, by the way. Yeah. Chalk and cheese as individuals. Um, and Rommel was saying, if to von Arnhem, or was saying actually to Kesselring, I need some of von Arnhem's forces, like 10, 10 Panzer Division. Give give them to me, and I will go straight through the Americans up to, up uh, uh, into Algeria, uh, in, uh, to the coast. Von Arnhem had different, different plans. And there were multiple proposals flying to and fro. The Italians had plans, the Rom Rommel had plans, von Arnhem had plans, um, and some of them were just pie in the sky. But what actually happened, that, that, so that was the, the, the possible route, and, and this gets a bit complicated, so forgive me for simplifying it, but the route that they actually took in the end, what actually happened in this policy vacuum, was a number of thrusts, all of which eventually failed all of which eventually failed. So there was one thrust through the Fide Pass. That was a pass through the uh, eastern dorsal. Um, uh, and there they, the uh, um, a multi-directional, if I can describe it as that, divisional attack on the Americans. The Americans were positioned on three hills at, at, at Fide. One of them, uh, uh, Lusada, which is where um, General Patton's son-in-law was a lieutenant colonel. Uh, he, he was captured there. But the three hills were not within um, mutually supporting distance. And when the Germans came came through, they were the, the, the Americans were completely flummoxed. The Germans came from the south. They came through the dorsal. They came from a southern uh, route as well. Uh, they did um, enveloping attacks. Um, completely confused the uh, Americans, and there was, frankly, uh, mass surrender going on at that point. Uh, a, a lot of troops did get out, and I'm not saying the Americans were cowards. They were just completely outwitted, outfoxed, um, had never come across anything quite like it before. The Germans tried to take some advantage of that by pushing their forces forward to a town called Splita, uh, Splita was an old Roman town, and that had a number of roads going off it through approaching the western dorsal. So if I just go to the next slide, you get to a town, as you, if you keep going past Splita, the town of Kasserine. Uh, and just there on the right is the um, where Rommel's uh, command post was. It's on the old uh, railway line. His command post was underneath there. And that's where, um, when Kesselring came over to try and, um, how shall I describe it, be like almost like a referee mm -hmm. between von Arnhem and Rommel as to who was going to go in what direction. Um, uh, that, that's where that's where uh, uh, Kesselring went underneath the, the railway bridge. Um, now, Kesselring, uh, if you look at the map, so Kesselring is at the bottom right-hand corner, and it's got a number of uh, directions it can go in. And at this point, the Kasserine Pass battle had still not been decided upon. They were really making it up on the hoof. Um, one, one idea was to go up to a town called Sabiba. It's not actually shown on the map, but it's, um, it's, it's northeast of, uh, of uh, Kasserine. Um, and they got up there. Rommel himself went up there with his forces, uh, couldn't turn around. Uh, sorry, I could, couldn't, couldn't go any further. It was a... Um, um, 
and it was a guards brigade with with the Americans that managed to stop him. So then he tried uh, going down through the Kasserine Pass itself towards the Algerian town of Tabessa, where there was a massive logistics base. Um, and he, the furthest he got with his forces, and this isn't often well known about Kasserine Pass, it doesn't quite meet the, meet the um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, narrative. Uh. Thank you, that'll do nicely, the narrative. The, the, the troops that got the furthest in the Kasserine Pass were Rommel's Italian troops. Oh, yeah. Um, Giving any credit to the Italians, either by the Axis or by the Allies, is is, is not how it goes. We, we must always insult the Italians. That's been the, the narrative. We're trying to, <laughs> trying to buck that trend a bit on this channel, but yeah. Yeah, that's very true. Um, but Tala was very interesting. So they went up, they, they also did a thrust up to Tala in the north there, uh, not very far from uh, Kasserine, and it's going up onto one of the steps, that the sort of tell area. So it's quite high in a plateau, rough ground, difficult area um and there was they had to send parts of anderson's first army down there to try and block that road and it was some very brave action was going on particularly with the brits particularly with the armor going uh, up that road slowly withdrawing um losing a couple of tanks here then you go another mile lose another couple of tanks then you another mile slowly withdrawing to tala Meanwhile, Tala is getting reinforced by a newly arrived infantry regiment, the Leicestershire Regiment, who start digging in as soon as they possibly can. And uh, But Anderson has no reserves. He has no reserves. So he calls on artillery reserves in Morocco, in Morocco, <laughs> the other side of North Africa. And they go nonstop, um, almost no sleep, all the way to Tala. I don't know what we're talking about. Three days, I think it was. Absolutely nonstop. Wow. And um, they immediately went straight into action. The um, the, the way um, uh, Rommel approached it was quite an interesting thing, though. They, he had some captured Valentine tanks. And at night, he followed the British tanks withdrawing into Tala with the German stroke British Valentine tanks and managed to get into the Leicester's position. And cause absolute mayhem. The Leicesters, as a regiment, broke without a doubt. They, um, something like 400 were so called missing in action. Mm. Uh, and effectively, they, they just ran. Uh, many of them did, did make their way back. But a, as a regiment, they were, they were pretty much broken. Um, and, and interestingly, the commanding officer of the American artillery regiment who managed to stop. Um, Rommel's panzers at that point uh, was Lieutenant Colonel Westmoreland, who in the 1960s became the American Supreme Commander in the Vietnam War. Yep. And uh, he, he often you know, um, drew on the lessons of that. Um, we've got, we've got a quick we... question about, about Kasserine before we yeah. do the video from, from Kevin Getz. And he's uh, and Mark Calhoun covered a bit of this in his presentation. But what are Trevor's thoughts on popular culture like the movie Patton driving the Kasserine narrative? And particularly, I would go in the simplicity of it, in the, in the Patton movie, it's one column of German tanks coming up one pass at one American position when, as you explained and Mark explained, it's part of a wider and much more complicated um uh, counter-offensive. So, so what's your feeling on on how the narrative is perceived, partly from the movies, but generally? Uh, Patton's movie needs to be remade. <laughs> I think we can all agree on that. It was yeah. of its time. It was of its time. Um, there would have been many people who, um, thousands of veterans and their descendants, um, alive when the Patton movie came out. Well, when did yeah. it come out? Was it 1970s? 1970, 1970, 1970, exactly, yeah. Yeah, well, there we go. I mean, they, they, they were 50, 60 years old. You know, that's no age at all. And um, so they I, I think they would have been very upset, but sort of understandable. It, it needs to make... I, I think today's audience wouldn't find it acceptable. Not at all. No, I think I think so. Um, you know, when you think about it, we're going down a movie review, but it's, also, it's trying to cover um, North Africa, Sicily, um, Normandy... The Ardennes offensive, the end of the war, in what and and also his kind of not private life, but his life as a commander. So it's trying to cram a lot in. So of course, 
you know, mm. Kasserine past sequence is simplified. But when you think about it, the Ardennes sequence is also ridiculously simplified. Yeah. That way, indeed, as is Normandy. But it's, the thing is, we can't bring George C. Scott back. Everyone, I was talking to James Holland last week, despite the fact that George C. Scott looking nothing like Patton and really sounding nothing like Patton, that we've all kind of that's who we think Patton sounded like. And I think unless we could bring him back, I, I don't know who we've got today who could feasibly be Patton. I know there was talk about a movie with uh, Ed Harris a few years ago that that hadn't happened. I think I could see Ed Harris carrying it off. But anyway. Okay. Okay. Um, um, I'll, I'll come on to Patton in a minute, actually. In a yeah, little while. I've got, I've got some views on him too. Um, could I ask you to play video number four, please? Yep. Yeah, will do. So it's got, they've got no sound, so feel free to talk over it. So here yeah, we go. Yeah. Okay. So this is on top of Jebel um, Hamra. I'm looking towards the uh, Fayed Pass in the far distance. Um, off to my left, that's a withdrawal or uh, route that they took. Um, there's a... Oh, it's a bit frozen. There we are. But there's a hill no, I, 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 just, I paused it a bit, that's all. Oh, OK. Well, there's, the hill and, there's a little hillock on the far distance on the left-hand side. That is Jebel Lusada. Uh, and that's where a lot of the uh, a lot of the problems happened. And down right in the centre of the valley, in all that village, uh, area there, is where one of the major tank battles happened around uh, Sidi Bouzid. Um, the other tank force came up the pass there that we're coming to now, on the right hand side. That's the direction they came. So it was wow. a it was a pincer movement, without a doubt. And where the sun is setting is the Kasserine Pass. Brilliant. Thank you. Right, got to bring the PowerPoint back up. There we go. There's us. Um, Hang on. There we go. There's us. Right. And could you um, just run the next the, the next video as well, back to back? Uh, number five, isn't it? So this has got audio, oh, isn't it? Right. Here we go. Yep. Here we go. Um... Hello. I'm Trevor Sheehan from African Stalingrad. This is the entrance to the Kasserine Pass in Tunisia, viewed from the town of Kasserine. So on the left was Jabal Chambi, on the right Jabal Samama, and there's the beginning of the town down there. I'm actually filming this from the Kasserine Pass monument. That's it there. Unfortunately, it's closed today, as it is on most days. But you get the general idea. So they're quite a nice part of town. Um, you can see Jabal Chambi over there, it's quite something. The very furthest hills are Algeria. Lovely spot today, very memorable, remarkable actually, what a sacrifice. So we had a couple of questions, um, Trevor, about why it was closed that day. And Richard has sort of been saying, was was it under security restrictions? Yeah, good questions, actually. Um, I, I'm, in theory, not meant to have gone to Kasserine because the British uh, Foreign Office advice is for uh, British um, citizens not to go there because there have been a few terrorist incidents in the hills. Um, but speaking to uh, people I trust who know the area said that is grossly exaggerated and that it's perfectly safe. Um, the biggest danger in Tunisia is the traffic, not the terrorists. <laughs> um, there hasn't been a terrorist incident in Tunisia for, you know, Paris is da is more dangerous than Tunisia, I can assure you. Um, no, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's um, it, I, I would describe it as safe. Okay. But you've got to make your own judgment about that sort of thing. I certainly wouldn't go to the Algerian border. Uh, okay, that's, that's fair enough. Fair. Um, but the, the town itself, it's fine, absolutely fine. Um, right, so um, the, the, the Kasserine Pass battles, there were multiple battles for the Kasserine Pass. As I've said there on my, in my, on my slide, it was a very opportunistic approach to it, extremely disjointed between the forces in the north and the forces in the south, and ultimately defeated in the sense that um, Rommel withdrew, and he withdrew back to Mareth. So there we are. Montgomery's army is now, is only slowly advancing. Rommel is back near the Mareth line with his forces and, and slightly north of it. And it's about what happens next. Well, what happened next was that Rommel felt 
that there was an opportunity for a preemptive strike on Montgomery's forces before the rest of the Eighth Army got to Moreth themselves. And his idea was to go through the Matmata Hills with his with three armored divisions, an amazing thing, at night, and then uh, fall on Montgomery's forces who were in and around Midneen, who were building up forces so that they could attack, in a few weeks' time, the Moreth line. Uh, meanwhile, in of the trot, the American forces, uh, now under Patton, Patton was only there for two weeks or so, yeah, two weeks, um, because uh, the previous corps commander had been sacked, um, were doing diversionary attacks to try and remind Rommel that they could still um, cut him off on the coast if they could. Um, uh, Rommel at this time was, a, by all accounts, a very uh, sick man. And he relied a lot on his divisional and corps commanders and on the Italian commanders, General Messe, uh, to do the, uh, the detailed planning work. But um, what, what doesn't come out, obviously, in the, for example, the official histories is the fact that Montgomery knew all about it. He knew it was coming. You could second guess it anyway. But uh, Enigma and Ultra yep. um, gave him advance notice of the attack. What he didn't know from Ultra is how powerful the force will be or what direction they were going to come from. He didn't have that information, but he did know the date. Um, so what Montgomery did, he went to this hill here, which is uh, nicknamed by the um, uh, Scots Guards, uh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh Hill. Um, uh, and, that, and that's where he did his recce's uh, for uh, the, the battlefield. Uh, what he also did was he accelerated the withdrawal of the Eighth Army up to up to, to Medneen in a colossal, the, the, the staff officers must have been pulling their hair out, a, a, a colossal move to bring um, hundreds of extra tanks and hundreds and hundreds of anti-tank guns, mines, wire, and all the rest that you need for a defensive battle knowing that a unknown quantity of Germans and Italians are going to be attacking you on this particular date, but you don't know quite what direction from. So that was where he did his, his, uh, his recce. Rommel, this is Rommel's OP, up, up on the Matmata, Matmata Mountains. It's a wonderful um, observation point. Mm. And this is where he not only did his recce's, this is also where he... Uh, um, watched i think well, let me think i've got this right the 21st and 15th panzer division pass through that valley below him and the Mednin battles itself is top right hand corner of that particular um uh, uh viewpoint could you run run the next uh, video please number yeah, here we go. six so this is rommel's op uh there's a couple of concrete bunkers there um, in great condition. I mean, frankly, if you threw away some of the rocks in the uh, on the floor of the uh, trenches, it, it would still be good to go. I think that's probably an ammunition bunker because there's no windows in it, or maybe a command a command post of some sort. Um, good thick overhead cover. That's one of the trenches at the OP position in, in the Matmata Mountains. And there is an anti. I, I believe I might be wrong. An anti aircraft gun emplacement. Um, if there's any experts on that sort of thing out there could um, let me know. And this is the and this is the view he had. That's the battlefield out there in the, on the wow. horizon. Absolutely Beautiful. stunning view. It does it was, does certainly look like uh, a, a typical anti uh, aircraft position from Normandy. Okay, this is this is a year earlier, or or, or even an anti tank. Sometimes they have a, a gun that could do both. But yeah, may, amazing footage. Um, now, what what you don't see there, it looks as if the flat ground down there looks very flat. But in fact, when you're down there at tank level, infantry, soldier level, there's actually a series of waddies, two in particular, big, strong waddies. And these are waddies which are dry. There's no water in them. Um, and they are very rough. Um, and they, when you go there, it, it, 
just looking at it, it sort of forces you when you're traveling around that area to go down the wadi and use it to, mm. to travel on. You don't want to be traveling up on the surface, as it were, because it's just e even, even more rough, uh, but very rocky. Uh, and that has a bearing, because if you look at the next picture, on the, on the mobile phone there is a photograph of a British anti-tank gun, and in front of that anti-tank gun are 12 German tanks knocked out by that one gun, by that one gun. Wow. And that was caused by the German panzers coming down towards Medinim and being channeled by the wadi, taking, taking the, the lazy routes. And those two wadis converged just near a village near Medinim. And they, I think Rommel lost something like 50 tanks in one day. And at the end of that one day, the Battle of Medinim, uh, Rommel uh, withdrew all the forces. He himself went back into the mountains to his command post in a little village called Beni Zelten. And then the next day after that, he drove to Sfax Airport and drove and flew out of out of Tunisia, never to return. Hmm. Um, and it was um, Montgomery described described it as the perfect defensive battle, a one day battle. Um, the British Army lost no tanks at all, not one. And, and here, uh, over 50. They did analyze in great detail that the sort of um, uh, army scientists examined in great detail who fired what shot. And they also tried out, after the battle, because they had so many hulks, they tried out the new 17-pounder on some of the, um, the, the hulks that, that they had uh, already hit. Um, and, and what they discovered was, that in the Battle of Benin, nearly all the damage was done by about four anti-tank guns. One of the anti-tank guns fired over 80 rounds uh, with a really determined crew, as you can imagine. And the anti-tank guns were also, when you go there on the ground, you discover that they're, they're nowhere near the infantry positions. They're out. They're almost out, out in front of the infantry positions. Right. Quite an unusual arrangement, in, in, in my experience. No, um, and just to, just to briefly to go down a rabbit hole, of, of people, of course, have talked about Rommel's state of mind and a lot of it and it's interesting mm. stuff to read about but it's often kind of conjecture isn't it because we can't really go back and you know is he putting extra effort in because he thinks it's his last campaign uh, campaign in North Africa does he know it's his last North Africa? how much is his illness affecting thing how much you know it's they're all they're all fascinating questions to raise but ultimately because he didn't write any memoirs because he you know he, he was, was dead a year later it's mostly just conjecture isn't it what's interesting though is that his state of mind his health must have been influencing how he approaches things but exactly what can what we can draw from that i don't know well oddly you, strange you should mention that actually paul because the um rommel did write a letter to his wife right during the battle of Midnin before it started it started at first light something like six in the morning in fog as it happens and he did write a letter and in that letter, he's from the OP. You saw that huge, that that, that fantastic view, uh, with lots of little, dotted with little farms, uh, poor little farms down, down the bottom. He did say there. He said after the war is over, uh, he thinks that Tunisia would make a beautiful German colony for German farmers. Um, so um, he was, he was uh, obviously thinking um, in imperialistic terms, as it were. Yeah. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Actually, I'm going to speed up if that's okay. Um, so more meat, less waffle. So here we go. Right, Horseshoe. The, 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 the next battle was a, a bit of a one-off, um, and it was a outpost of the Mareth line that was attacked by a guards brigade, a newly arrived guards brigade, never seen combat, hadn't been at El Alamein, and, and Montgomery thought it would be good to get them blooded with a, uh, an attack. Um, that's what they attacked, at, uh, and they call it horseshoe because the series of hills look like a horseshoe. Uh, and they walk straight into a, a really, really dense minefield uh, that was put there by the 164th uh, Light Division. Um, that truck there is heading down towards uh, Libya. It's on, on, on the Libyan road. Um, you'll see there also there's a lot of um, debris left behind. There's a bunker there. There's uh, unexploded and exploded artillery shells. Uh, all it, It's... I personally, there is a path going through the minefield, um, and I've been on that path, but I wouldn't want to step off it because it was a very, very dense uh, uh, minefield as it happens. 
Um, right. How do you attack the Moreth line? This was Montgomery's plan. Two, two stages to it. The first one, a, 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 brig, a single brigade would attack near the coast on an extremely narrow frontage, break through, and then be followed by two armoured divisions right behind them. That was that was his idea. As part of that, and that's bullet point number two, he formed the New Zealand Corps. So that was the New Zealand division plus additional troops, many of them British, to do a big left hook around the Matmata Hills, to go around the back of the Moreth line and cut off uh, any retreating troops that might be there. They had to go through a gap, the Tobago Gap, also known as the Alhama Gap. And that was the gap between the Matmata Hills and the Chot. And that has a huge bearing. I, I would add that le left hook was something like 200 miles through uncharted territory. And the way they found their way through that was through the benefiting from the work done by the Long Range Desert Group, who found routes. And, and, and they went in um, 13 vehicles uh, in columns, 13 columns wide, um, and there were hundreds of tanks, thousands of troops, thousands of trucks went through this desert. Um, and um, if you go on Google Earth now and look at that route, you can see the 13 tracks through the desert are still there 80 wow. years later, which is quite, quite, quite something. So they left, they, they left their mark. Now, on the Moreth line, I think Montgomery did a, did a pretty massive mistake. Um, he, he, he got some uh, French officers to do a map for him because they knew the, the ground very well from their uh, previous time there. And if you look in this, this is a copy of the map, uh, which I got from the um, Edinburgh, uh, the, sorry, the National Library of Scotland. I, I think it might be the only one, actually, because um, it's all hand drawn. And what are the points they make? about the area he went to wanted to go through over that uh, uh, wadi, the wadi zigzag, was it's liable to be full of water. And the other point they make is it would be impassable without detailed preliminary work, except on the track shown. Montgomery, for whatever reason, chose to ignore that advice and stuck with his plan of going through over the wadi in a very, very narrow area. Uh, that's where the actual wadi crossing is. You'll see there, that's the type of bunker that they've got down there. And again, go on Google Earth um, satellite view and you'll see all the bunkers. You'll see the anti-tank ditches. Um, you'll see the infantry positions. You'll see the wadi. They're as clear as daylight. Uh, and it's the most well-preserved battlefield I've ever been to. Quite remarkable, it's a terrific spot. There's a memorial at the, uh, at, at the crossing point to the Durham Light Infantry, who took the brunt of the fighting. So that, it was a frontal attack on a very narrow front. Um, that was defeated. That attack was defeated, mainly by the Italians. There were, there were some counterattacks by the Germans, but the bulk of the work in defeating the, that British brigade was done by the Italians. So his, his plan was failing. So he decided that the New Zealand Corps wouldn't be a secondary diversionary sort of attack, that actually it would morph into the main attack. And the way he did that was he added a further division, the 1st Armoured Division, uh, to that attack. And the whole force was now, you know, it was a core size plus now. Um, and, and the 1st Armoured Division, they didn't have any maps. Didn't, <laughs> they, they had to move now. Um, and go all the way around those 200 miles to get to the Tobago Gap to join the New Zealanders. Um, so uh, M Monty did a thing which I still can't quite understand. He then decided to have two core commanders. So he added Horrocks to the mix. Um, so anyway, there we are. That's the um, that, that that's the gap. That's the 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 start line for the attack through the Tobago Gap was an old Roman wall which is uh, still very much there. And that's the, uh, you'll see there on the top shot uh, is the, where the Roman wall is. It's quite it's quite small now. Elhammer village in the far, far end. Uh, top right is a, a typical Axis defensive position. Uh, they're all over that battlefield. And there is a memorial 
Hill 209 uh, Memorial, where a Victoria Cross was won by a uh, New Zealand Maori. Brilliant. You still there, Trevor? Oh, is Trevor frozen? I think we've temporarily lost Trevor. Are you are you are you still there? No, I am. Yeah, we, we lost you for a moment. I thought you were deep in okay. thought. All right. Well, just just uh, very quickly to say, um, down near the Elhammer village, um, at that point, the New Zealanders were going to split right, and the First Armour Division were going to continue forward, uh, which is what they did. But the First Armour Division was held up by about two or three 88 millimeter guns for two days. Mm. And it's a reminder to us all that whilst we talk about big divisions and corps and so on, at the end of the day, it's about a gun crew who are motivated enough to take on an armoured division on their own. And they, they, uh, they did that very well. And that, that delayed um, the withdrawal of the Axis forces from Moreth to the next line behind, which was Wadi Akarit. Uh, I'll just say a couple of words about the Americans. Whilst all this was going on, they are pushing and probing uh, battles around El Guitar, uh, the town of Maknasi, Mizuna, and so on in, in that area, putting pressure on the Germans saying, we're going to cut you off from the coast if they can. Um, could you now run, please, video number seven? Will do. Here we go. Hello, I'm Trevor Sheehan from AfricanStyleAndGrad.com on uh, General Patton's command post. So there's lots of foxholes, slit trenches, uh, command posts. It's overlooking the El Guitar Road towards where 10th Panzer Division attacked uh, this area. It's very close to the front line. It's a place called Wed Kadab. The main road passes through these little hills and in the plain directly in front of the OP is where 10th Panzer Division came. That's me pointing to it. Uh, I'm accompanied by the director of the local village museum, the El Gitar Museum, uh, which is primarily military re relics taken off the battlefield. That's the other side of the wadi on the far side of the road. This is the command post. In fact, this is where there's a famous photograph of Patton with a couple of other generals uh, overlooking a little ridge. So there's a couple of, they've dug out some small caves uh, that's looking back. Oops, okay, ab oops, absolutely brilliant stuff, Trevor. Thank you so much for these. Okay. Um, could you now play the next video, which is number eight? There we go. Hang on. I'm Trevor Sheehan from AfricanStalingrad.com. This is the site where Klaus von Stauffenberg was injured in 1943. He was the operations officer for 10 Panzer Division, and he was withdrawing through this pass, having encountered General Patton's American forces at El Guitar. I'm now going to read the account of what actually happened from Hoffman's book on Stauffenberg. With a few armoured radio cars, Stauffenberg went through the El Hafe Pass, drove along the northern edge of separate El Nual, and stopped near Borge Buhagna. When Lieutenant Riel arrived with the 5th Company of the K-10, he found Stauffenberg standing in his jeep with his armoured radio cars stopped nearby, endeavouring to direct the improvised retreat. He said to Riel, we shall be lucky if we get out of this. Wow. Well, he he was obviously very badly injured, and uh, um, it, oddly enough, the film is it was it was it Valkyrie? Um, Valkyrie with Tom Cruise, yeah. Yeah, the scene where he gets injured, the ground looks really really similar. It was a bit spooky actually. I mean, they didn't film it there, but probably filmed it in Arizona or something. But um, it is remarkably uh, similar. Um, I'm going to speed up, uh, Paul, because I'm conscious of the time. There is the El Guitar Valley. So Patton on the left, um, he's got a couple of routes uh, and it is quite a gap. Uh, again, it, it looks very flat. It's not flat when you get down on the ground. That's for, that's for sure. So 
he was putting pressure on Rommel, uh, so not on Rommel, on the he, Rommel had gone by this point, but the uh, Axis forces had withdrawn from Mareth to the Accurate line. So there's Accurate down there. And that's what it looks like. So it, there's the coast, then there's a hill, Jabal Rumama, then there's an anti-tank ditch because the ground is flat, and then a big hill called Jabal Zuai. And that map is... Um, part of the 4th uh, Indian Division tactical map. Mm. These are the sort of positions they had to take. So there, there, there's Rumana. That was taken by the uh, 51st Highland Division. Um, and there was uh, 50th Northumbrian Division uh, doing the anti-tank ditch. Um, the, the picture at the bottom is the cluster of hills and gullies, almost like a series of interlocking quarries, if I could describe it as that, that the 4th Indian Division took. And that was Francis Tuca's division. Yeah. The thing I find remarkable is that he only had he's, he, he was a, only a two brigade division, uh, but he took that position at night, and I, I just find that mind boggling. I, I found it difficult to walk around in in daylight, let alone being shot at at night. Uh, quite a remarkable position, uh, Wadi Akarit. Um, Wadi Akarit was taken in a one day battle, and the. Axis forces with, were withdrawing back up the coast towards Tunis as fast as they could be taken. Uh, and, and the criticism, one criticism of, of Montgomery is at this point, why didn't he manage to overtake them or stop them in some way? Well, one mm. way, collectively, as an as because you've got Alexander, General Alexander, in charge of uh, both Monty's army and Anderson's army in the 18th Army Group at this point was to cut them off in the middle. Um, and the place chosen was the Fondue Gap, another gap through the dorsals. And this was Crocker. I think Crocker, the, as the corps commander, didn't he appear in Normandy as well? Wasn't he a corps yep. commander in Normandy? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So th this, is, this is his first corps battle, uh, using the French and um, Americans in that particular battle. Uh, you saw the video at the beginning where I discussed it. So the aim was to try and cut them off, uh, but he failed. And the Southern Axis Army joined the Northern Axis Army. And what they effectively created was a, a, a Festung Tunisienne, um, and they were holed up around Tunis and the Cape Bon Peninsula. The American Two Corps, uh, Second Corps, was, was then moved to Northern Tunisia, uh, a remarkable feat, actually, because they had to cross the lines of the First Army, so logistically incredible, and Montgomery's uh, forces moved right up to the Enfideville area. And that's pretty much what it looked like there. I'm just looking at my notes here. Right, so we're, 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 we're heading towards the end of the Axis forces in Tunisia. So I'm hoping it's all making sense at this point. It so is. Are, just, to, just to jump in, because people over these two weeks have, have been saying that not enough time is spent talking about Tunisia. And there can be criticism of both Montgomery and 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 the German commanders at various points and American commanders. When you see it like this and you've taken it through, there's a lot going on here. There, both sides are yeah. both simultaneously advancing and defending, uh, depending on where you are in 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 the in the position. Mm -hmm. You've got troops from several different countries, and they're not not least of which are Italian, New Zealand, uh, French troops. You've got some commanders who've been here for a long time, but they're possibly experienced but weary. You've got other commanders who are fresh to battle but haven't yet fought it, it, on the continent. There's a, there's an awful lot of elements to this to make it really, really complicated. And I think, you know, the cursory overview it gets in some checkbooks about, oh, well, they kind of finished off and landed. They went and landed in Torch and they got to Tunis, to Tunis five months later. A kind of missing an incredible amount of... Um, Toing and throwing in this part of the battle. Mm. I'm, I'm making this part of the battle extremely simple because it's yeah, actually, I was saying, yeah, I was just that point. You're, you're not even going to the level of complication you could, and it's already. <laughs> if a I, lot if of I, put, cards. I put all the arrows in in their literally their correct positions, would it would end up looking like a plate of spaghetti, and yeah. and you wouldn't get anything from it. So I'm, I'm keeping it dead simple. Um, so the the Axis forces are definitely pinned into the corner. Uh, before they they have before they the uh, coup de grace goes in by particularly by Anderson's first army direct to Tunisia uh, to Tunis City, um, the 
the peaks overlooking the Mejez start line have to be cleared. And and wasn't that Ian Mitchell's uh, presentation about the back yep. of the peaks? Um, and incredibly about incredibly important. If if that hadn't been achieved, then they wouldn't have been able to cross the start line into Tunis. That's for sure. Um, there was an attempt, a proper attempt to take Tunis, but it failed. Anderson's uh, first attempt failed, and so the decision was made to transfer some of Monty's army round to Anderson's army to go completely over the top and uh, punch a hole into Tunis. The aim was to split the Axis forces in two, a northern half and a southern half. That was the that was the aim. Uh, and that's a, a trace from uh, uh, the map. And there was about three, or was it four? No, three, three divisions side by side on a three mile frontage um, with a huge amount of air support. Um, and, and of course they were going to get through with that sort of level of um and, and Anderson actually did um and I think he needs credit for this, he made a very, very bold decision at this point, and that was to use up all his artillery shells, even those in reserve. Mm. If this had failed, he'd have had no uh, uh, the next um load of artillery that was due to arrive in Tunisia was three weeks away. Wow. Still on board a ship, so but he, he his aim was to use massive firepower in a very very concentrated way, with the help of uh, some of Monty's troops. Now at this period, during this fighting, there were three what I've described as three epics. The Americans had one at Hill Six Hundred Nine. There was the Boo, and there was Tekrina. I'll just very quickly take you through those. So the northern Tunisia, very very different. As you can see, there's cork forest, there's farmland. There's rugged hills and so on. That's Hill 609 from the city of uh, uh, Nasir Matur Road. And it's got a cracking view. In fact, if you could just run, uh, it's just a quick video, uh, video number nine. Yep. There we go. <clears throat> so um, as you can see, it's uh, good farmland, uh, rolling hills. And this is the view from the top of Hill 609 has a very, very commanding view. Uh, I mean, really, you can't... If you're down there you and you don't hold 609, then you're you're going to be pinned down for sure. Wonderful spot if you get the chance to go. Wow. I mean, incredible. People are absolutely loving the videos, by the way. <laughs> it's it's, it's a bringing everything we've done those previous two weeks to life. So, so much. thank you so much. Good. Well, thank you. Um, and the Americans were very proud of how they um, took Hill 609. Um, in many ways, it's wrong, actually, to call it Hill 609 because there were multiple hills all surrounding Hill 609 that all had to be taken in one fell swoop. And uh, at this point, uh, Bradley was uh, in charge of the whole thing. And he had an armor division uh, to, to hand as well. But they didn't take any of the hill, uh, any of those particular hills. Uh, the next one is, uh, is the Boo. And this is, um, I mentioned earlier about you had to secure the peaks before you could move out of Mejez to Tunis. But actually in front of Mejez, there's another small hill called the Boo. And that was really the last hilly defense before you hit the Tunis road. Uh, you had to go over the Majerda River. And this is the view from, uh, from Longstop. And the chosen unit were the, uh, the newly arrived Irish guards were put in to take that hill along with with, with some others. Uh, Victoria Cross was one on, on the hill. Uh, they did take it, and it was quite an epic battle, for sure. De Kroona, very different again. Um, De Kroona was um, in the 8th Army sector, and it was a single hill sticking out of the plain, as they do, like, a bit like a beached yeah. whale. And at the top of the hill, there's a village. And you can see here, this is a, a captured German map dated uh, 17th of April, and you can see Tukruna sticking out, uh, and their, their blue line is really the Enfiedeville line, named after the village, and Tukruna was meant to be almost like a, um, uh, a bump stop, as it were, from to, to any advance. And I think I'm writing saying... Yes, could you run another... video number 10, please? 
Yeah, and I'm reminding people to watch the programme from last week with Glenn Harper because obviously it's all about the New Zealand yeah. division, so there's there's more details. But but this video will add a whole lot of perspective to, to those who've seen that. So here we go. So I, I filmed it from a, a double beer beside Takruna, which is uh, where the German uh, artillery unit were. But the Takruna battle was an Italian battle. And it's particularly where the Italian Folgore Parachute Regiment uh, fought and pretty much stopped uh, the 8th Army. That um, is an amazing, amazing I uh, think, I, think it was, there, it, I think it was either today or yesterday, I'm not sure which, I think it might be today, that the Italian embassy are having their annual Takruna ceremony at the site. Um, and for the very first time, I mean, I, I, I usually go to them almost every year, um, certainly for about the last 10. And I think I'm right in saying today's ceremony is the first time the British defence attaché has attended. Wow. Because usually the British and American defence attachés are not invited because they were the enemy combatants. Um, but this time they are. They are, they, they are going. Um, right. So splitting the forces. Um, they did manage to uh, split the forces. And uh, one... Uh, so they, they got into Tunis. Um, and it, the Tunis anniversary of the first troops arriving is today. Today, 80 years ago. Uh, but it's one thing getting into the cities... Um, and by the way, the German troops in Bezert, um surrendered first, uh, surrendered to the Americans, although the Americans and Brits both arrived in their respective cities at the same time. Uh, the Americans actually um, handed the city over in terms of the formal surrender to the French troops who were attached to the Americans. And those French troops were from a very unusual unit called the Corps Franc, uh, Corps Franc Afrique, CFA who were made up of irregulars. There were a lot of um, communists there. There were uh, uh, s a lot of Spaniards in it um, uh, and a lot of uh, displaced people, let's put it that way. Very, very odd unit. Um, once in Tunis, they then had to get through a, a, a very unusual uh, defile called Haman Leaf, um, where the mountains actually get down to the coast. Um, uh, and again, they were held up by uh, two 88mm guns, the, the uh, tank forces of the 6th Armoured Division. Uh, and the way they got round it was they drove the Shermans down onto the beach and the Shermans followed one behind the other along the beach, doing something I didn't think Shermans could do, which is firing on the move. Whether they actually hit anything, I don't know. because Ah, uh, well, uh, as James Holland would say, it's because the Sherman for its... It's 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 high and it's it's perhaps undergunned and underarmed, but it does have that stabilized gun in the turret, which means it can engage targets whilst moving on, which is, was a distinct advantage it had, uh, one of its okay. only distinct advantages. But that means they can fire on the move, and the commander has the override over the gunner to control the turret. So if he sees a target, he can swing it around. So the shaman in that kind of environment, pretty good. So um, okay, well they were firing on they were firing on the beach. And I don't know of any other time Shermans have ever been down on the beach other than on D-Day. Um, but they, they were actually going along the beach doing their thing. And they managed to get round it. Um, as they got round, they, um, the 1st Army started meeting the 8th Army, as it were, head to head. Uh, von Arnhem's forces were most definitely beaten at this point, And von Arnhem decided to surrender in the little village of Summary Duzit. That's where the surrender uh, took place. Uh, and there's an olive grove just behind this house where his forces were encamped. Um, and uh, he was met by some soldiers from the 4th Indian Division, Tuka's uh, lot. Um, there were a few conditions to him being taken in to surrender. One was he said he did not want to surrender to black troops and also that any French people who were on in the German army uh, would, if they were taken by the French, would not be executed. Um, both um, demands were ignored. 
quite rightly too. Uh, the final surrender was taken at uh, Sidi Bou Ali, which is an olive grove just south of uh, Sousse. So if you ever go there on holiday, that's uh, that's where it is. Yep. Um, the final troops to surrender, this is even after von Arnhem and the Italian uh, 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 Messe troops, was the real diehards, and that was the Young Fascist Division near Tacruna on point one four one. And if you go there today, there was a... a a plaque, unfortunately, it's been a bit, bit, bit vandalized, but it lists all the people who died. And uh, after the Tacruna Italian embassy ceremony, the there are quite a lot of hardcore Italian fascists go to point 141 and they have a bit of a powwow and do whatever fascists do, uh, these sort of things. Uh, but that's they were the very last people to uh, surrender. And, and that's largely because they pretty much run out of ammunition, actually. Mm. But um, they were the last ones. Brilliant. And to absolutely finish, finish, uh, Paul, um, it uh, the country was taken. Now, interestingly, the British Embassy today has done a tweet about uh, uh, about the uh, about the war in Tunisia, and they said the Tunisian people were liberated um, by the Allies. That's not how the Tunisians see it. The majority of them felt that the Germans and Italians, particularly the Germans, had liberated them, not the Allies. So there's there's still a bit of a historical narrative to be picked out and, and, and picked apart to truly understand what actually happened. Be that as it may, um, that's how it finished. And I think that's how I'd like to finish my presentation. Brilliant. Well, we've got your last video to play silently while we're doing some questions. And and I'm going back because some of them are quite a few uh, pages back on the sidebar. One was asking about the earlier when you had well, the French unit. Uh, now they're on the Allied side. How are they performing? We, we talk a lot about the mm. British gradually getting their act together, the Americans sort of going on a big learning curve. But the French, where where, where, where would you sort of put their, their, their combat prowess at this point? Um, that's, that's a really good question, actually. In in, um, in March, no, wrong. In February, the first um, uh, the first Sherman tanks arrived in uh, Tunisia um, to re-equip the Sixth Armored Division, and so the Sixth Armored Division gave up their existing tanks and gave them to the French. So they had had. Uh, Valentines, Crusaders, I think they had Grants as well, so a bit of a mm. bit of a mixed bag, and these were tanks which had been pretty well used and pretty well hammered, but the French were incredibly grateful to receive them, incredibly grateful, and because up until then they'd had clapped out trucks and um, the odd anti tank weapon, so slowly but surely, in fact, it, actually it was one of the benefits of winning the war in Tunisia, is that the French army could get a grip of its political leadership, yeah. um, get some proper command and control, uh, put aside a lot of its military, political and social differences and get re-equipped and become the very fine army they did become in 44 and 45. And it, it started in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. I there think that's were... what we said earlier, Trevor. It's the... The people who ignore the Tunisian campaign are ignoring at their peril this really important transitional phase. I said it again, it's a transition of equipment. You know, they're going from a whole variety of types of armored vehicle to when you get later into Italy and, and Normandy, they've kind of settled on a fewer types. You know, the, the Sherman, of course, the Cromwell comes in and the Churchill, but you know, they're phasing through various different types of equipment. They're kind of beginning to impose their way, the allies of waging a war onto the Axis rather than responding to what the Axis are doing. So I think. You know, we talk about the, the lessons learned for Norma, the lessons learned for Casino and Anzio. And I think, you know, yes, there's lots learned in Husky in Sicily. We will be covering that in July. But I think Torch, and particularly beyond the Torch, what you've been talking about, these battles across towards Tunis and Bizarre, that, that there's a lot of um, learning we can do 80 years on from that campaign that, that we haven't been doing, I think. Yeah, I, I'd say that's uh, completely correct. I mean, I think it was, I mean, I, mean, I think right at the very beginning, You've got this completely crazy start, and you end up with being masters of the North African shores, and it it, it was a tremendous effort, 
And I think a lot of that is down to um, obviously gaining combat experience, good yeah. leadership. Um, uh, soon afterwards, actually, and I'm not sure whether it was before Husky or not, um, the British Army produced a pamphlet called Lessons from the War in Tunisia. And uh, it was to be read by officers and senior NCOs. And uh, it's an outstanding book. And I, I honestly thought that the main, before I read it, that the main lesson would be something like put more emphasis on all arms battle or put more emphasis on countering mines or uh, gain more experience with the directing artillery. It wasn't any of that. The number one lesson that they stressed for the British soldier for forthcoming battles, learning from Tunisia, was battle inoculation. It's about soldiers getting used to battle. The noise, the smell, the hardship, the lack of sleep, the lack of food, the grind, the getting in from a, a patrol at five o'clock in the morning and then having to dig in somewhere and then abandon that trench and go out on another patrol and do that day in, day out. Really mm. hard, rugged, physical and mental effort. Mm survive and thrive in that battlefield and yeah that was the number one lesson in that in that uh, army booklet thank you very much and richard o'sullivan is reminding me of course that uh, politely that in all this talking about the learning curve the allies are going through which which is important and 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 critical to what happened later on thousands of lads didn't leave tunisia thousands didn't leave north africa mm -hmm. so although the allies leave there with a renewed um, uh, sense of experience and, and what not how how to do things, they're leaving behind a lot of dead there that perhaps we we are not we're not focusing on enough in in our understanding of this campaign. So that, thank you for reminding me of that, Richard. Yeah, um, yeah, we've got a question you. about and it will, ha will also apply to your um, your visiting there. Is how good were what Scott is asking? What were the quality of maps available to the Allies at the time? <laughs> Well, interestingly, when the Germans first arrived in um, in Tunis, um, one of the first things they did was raid the local library and uh, get um, uh, get copies of the Tunisian maps, which were been printed by the uh, French. They generally speaking were nineteen thirty seven maps, well printed, pretty clear, uh, one to fifty thou and one to 100 thou maps. They did do one error in my in my view, which is they overlaid a lot of vegetation data on the map, so it's difficult to read the contour lines. Now, the British um, had really rubbish maps at the beginning, uh, printed in Algeria and Morocco, many of them. Uh, the Eighth Army um, had theirs uh, shipped over. Um, very, very poor. And to, to the extent that when you get to something like Wadi Akarit, the, 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 the map, the original French map of Wadi Akarit was so poor that, that the um, RAF took it upon themselves to do aerial mapping of the whole area. And then the map service from the Royal Engineers then recreated their own map. It was the only way they could possibly do it. And, and the, the crucial thing is not, not just to know where you're going and so on, it's be able to direct artillery fire. So mm. you give, you've got to give them a grid reference. Yeah. Very difficult to pick out a landmark in some of that those bits of land. Um, uh, oddly enough, some because of the difficulty in mapping, an awful lot of hills and features were given nicknames. It's the only way you could direct artillery fire. So you had things like, obviously we've got Longstop Hill, but you've got things like Two Tree Hill, Stuka Farm, um, One Tree Hill, Three Tree Hill, um, and, and and so the, the that that was a one consequence of, of having such yeah. poor maps. Brilliant. Then we'll do a couple more. Then we will go because I know, folks, you all want to go and watch the We Have Ways live stream. So uh, uh, we'll do that. But quick one for um, were amphibious landings ever considered at all to get behind the Germans, Italians? So round tunis from the sea. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the uh, the the idea was to do a an amphibious assault uh, from Malta to Sousse. And the idea was that that's where they, as the Americans were coming across the land, heading towards Sousse and Sfax, as it happens, um, that the landing would uh, coincide with that. That was uh, absolutely. 
the big issue was landing craft. Where mm, do you find landing craft? Yep. Landing craft were on their way to Tunisia for Sicily. So even before the the end in Tunisia, the landing craft were already aboard ships heading towards Bizerte and Tunis. Um, but they weren't available, sadly, for um, uh, a proper assault during the main the main battle. But great question, I have to say. And this is our last one. And you kind of covered it a little bit, but um, was it hard for you to get over there? Does the local government support in the historical areas? Um, and, you know, in general, how much interest is there from the locals? Is it easy? Are they signposted? Are you kind of having to kind of do your own navigation there and find things for yourself? Yeah, I have to find them for self. I mean, the, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission do a fantastic job of highlighting their, their their cemeteries and there's a good um half a dozen or so of them biggest one is at Mejes and the next one is at uh, uh in Fiedeville. and they are excellent um and tourists do go there but if mm. i went to the sfax uh, war cemetery um what six weeks ago and i looked at the visitor book um there's been about uh let me think about 30 visitors in three years wow it's not good not good. No, I mean, I, tourists, I, 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 tourists don't go there. Um, the northern ones, like in Fiederville, um, you, you do get a lot of tourists because it's close to the resorts. Yeah, I mean, was, that came up in one of the previous shows is the resorts all along the Tunisian coast there. You know, I think it was with Vince O'Hara talking about that Casablanca area. Now it's all, you know, the, mm. those, those kind of fully, fully inclusive resorts, things like that. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a battlefield that people can get to. It, it involves a lot more planning and preparation than perhaps just getting on a on a ledger tour or a World War II museum well, my, tour. Well, Normandy, tip, or something yeah, like that. I mean, I mean, the, the battlefield tour companies, the established ones, don't go there for whatever reason. They go to Sicily and they go to Normandy and so on, but they don't go to Tunisia. Don't know why. If you're going to do it on your own, do a bit of planning, get the official history, um, hire, hire your own car. You don't need a driver, mm. but you do need to have your wits about you in terms of driving on a yeah. Tunisian road. They're a bit, bit dangerous. The roads quality is very, very good. Hotels are dirt cheap away from the tourist resorts. You know, I'm staying in a three, four star hotel, half board, 35 quid a night. Yeah. You know, what's not what's not to like? Um, the police are friendly, helpful. Um, and, and as far as the locals are concerned, they they <laughs> I remember one local coming up to me and saying, Why are you taking photographs of a hole in the ground? And <laughs> difficult yeah. to answer that question. But yeah, they they um they they don't have the Second World War in their national curriculum. No, I mean, it, and it's not part of the 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 the, the, the day to day thinking of your average Tunisian. I mean, I've got a friend here. I said before you went live, Igor, who's a, a guide in Normandy in the summer, but he lives in Tunisia for the rest of the year. And he said, you know, people are interested vaguely in Carthage and some of the old the old mm -hmm. battles, that, but that well, World War Two seems to have passed them by. And uh, you know, we could go down a rabbit hole talking about that. But um, I should point out that Kevin Hemel, who was on last week talking about Patton, he's trying to get a tour. Uh, you know, week long or two week long tour that kind of follows some of the American advance through that part of the world, not just Tunisia, but also um, um, into Sicily. So watch this space, but we will bring things to end. So people can go and watch uh, Jim and Al, those are members of the, we have ways team. And for those who are uh, world war two TV fans, we're back again tomorrow for our concluding panel discussion. Um, although we've still got Mike Nyberg on Thursday coming back. It was going to be the first show. It's going to be, been going to be the end last show of the series. So we can go back and take us to some of the politics. But the, politics, but the panel show tomorrow will be really interesting. We've got um, some thoughts on the, 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 how, what, how this affects the, the Italian uh, perspective, the French perspective. So that would be really good. So we'll do that tomorrow. So Trevor, outstanding presentation. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So did the viewers. You can come back any time and do a deeper dive on any of these aspects. You're, you're more than welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, so folks, I'll see you all tomorrow. This is Paul Vanessa from World War II TV saying enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, everybody. Bye.